Thank you to NordPass for supporting the channel and making your life a little easier. NordPass is a password manager designed by cybersecurity experts. You don't want to rely on your browser saving your password when NordPass has a stronger encryption algorithm protecting your data from hackers. Your web browser stores your passwords in a cloud, which is super unsafe. NordPass encrypts your passwords before they reach the cloud. So that way hackers can't get your information. You get strong passwords all stored in one place for easy management, and only you can access them with a master password. You can store your credit cards as well as passwords knowing the encryption will keep them better secured. They have a data breach scanner to check if your credit cards have been leaked. They check if you're using a password for several accounts, which is super unsafe. And not even NordPass can view your passwords. So you know the horror stories of the PlayStation Store? getting hacked, and then a bunch of people's data and information was leaked, and then they had to do a big apology. That's not gonna happen with NordPass. If you wanna make your life just a little bit easier, you can get 70% off a two-year premium plan with an extra month free using my discount code, Negative Legend. And if you're like me, and you've actually had people who have tried to get into your social media accounts, and uh, you have had to change your passwords several times, and you don't like having your passwords in a web browser, but you're not sure what else to do because you just have so many passwords for so many different things because that's part of your job, NordPass is literally a godsend. And better yet, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't vibe with it. You can import all the passwords on your browser and install the browser extension to make everything that much easier. Don't forget that 70% off a two-year premium plan using code Negative Legend and an extra month free. Click the link down in the description or in the pinned comment below. From the people who brought you, uh, super monsters? Brings you Supernatural Academy. They're both supers. I don't think that's intentional, but hey. Based on the books from Jamie and Eve. And you know, I like and don't like when a studio adapts a book into a show or movie, largely because it shows that Hollywood still can't do anything on its own anymore and needs either to take material from something else or just needs to reboot something. Otherwise, the movie usually flops. But not only that, Whenever it's based on a book, usually the experience has always been, wow, this is great. I can't wait to read the book. Wow, now that I've read the book, I hate the show. However, I did go to my local Barnes and Noble and ask if they had the book in stock and they didn't. So I decided I'm going into this, sh this show blind, but don't say I didn't try. I realized I have a tablet. I could have bought it digitally. Wow, I'm an idiot. Oh well, I don't need to compare and contrast everything. Someone out there is going to read the book and then have a scathing video about how it differs from the show. Some, someone is going to do that. Someone more qualified than I am because I don't have time to read the books. This is an original series from Peacock, which is a streaming service that I made fun of on my TikTok. And I will continue to make fun of Peacock regardless of whether or not this show is good or bad. Hey, Jessa, saved your spot. Hey. Thanks for helping out, Darby. Isn't it great that Jessa got here? This guy has to be the villain, right? Or at least a friend turned into a villain, right? Because like, are you kidding me? That power is horrifying. Can you imagine? Hey, wanna go back to my place? Um, no thanks. Uh, okay, wanna come back to my place now? You see, this is why magic doesn't exist. It's not a world of wonder, it's a world of lawsuits. This is the main character, Jessa. Okay, well, one of the main characters. And she attracts the eye of every incredibly handsome guy. And she has the problem of not wanting to break up her friends by dating them. I guess some people think they can get away with anything because their father is council leader. We're off to a good start. If this is supposed to be a school setting, then I need someone to hate. But also, where did they get the money for that kind of food? You know this school is supernatural if they get three course meals for lunch. And this is a totally normal human girl who lives a totally normal human life. And there's no reason why you should pay attention to her because there's nothing weird about her. Your new girlfriend's cute. Does she swing both ways? Wow, they get catcalled and harassed in only two sentences? I guess this show is realistic. About that run. Whoa, slow down there. I heard this was a reverse harem from a weird review that I read, but gosh, I didn't think I'd get, get steamy this fast. Turns out she's a werewolf and he's a dragon and they ditch class to go running for fun and bonding and steamy romance and tree soda. Okay, neat. On their run, some rando gets caught by the headmaster and uh, brings him through a weird magic door? Looks sketchy. And somehow Misha sees a vision of it and draws it. Who's the kid? What's with the door? I just 
get these pictures in my head. Misha's mom is single and has to work all the time, so Misha has to learn to be super responsible. All the while, Jessa has a bunch of friends and doesn't seem to have the same problems. But you know the Lion Clan and the Bear Clan already resent having a wolf shifter in charge. Until I see who the head of the Lion Clan is, I am going to imagine that it is Aslan from Narnia. I know it's wrong, but I do not care, it is funny to me. Turns out magical people came from the Fey Realm, and each clan had their own kingdom, and the Dragon King was basically a tyrant and he killed everyone. They killed him eventually, and they fled here because they lost their home and humans don't know they exist? I know we promised to all just be besties forever. I really like Jessa. Look, I love Jessa, but she is way too high stress for me. Now that's what I like to see. Bros being bros. Can't wait for all this to fall apart. And then Misha has a dream of her turning into a wolf and fighting another wolf. The first episode in a series is usually very cluttered. We need to introduce the main characters, we need some exposition of the backstory, we need to drop hints at the bigger plot so we can lay the foundation for the rest of the story, we need to set up mysteries to keep the audience invested. There's a lot that needs to go on. However, this show does a good job of it so far. It knows to keep the exposition short, don't spend too much time on the characters, you gotta like slowly build throughout the episode. It starts with some simple school drama, to revealing a weird mystery, to weird visions and clan wars. And this all happens within like the first 15 minutes. I always prefer it when a show does a little bit of something and then you, that's just a taste, you get a little taste of something else and then a little taste of something else and a little taste of something else. Okay, that's at the very beginning. Do you like any of those? Yes, continue reading or watching. I always find it's a very effective method whenever it comes to constructing a narrative. I'm used, I use narrative a lot in my videos now. That's like my favorite word. And given that this first episode has been done pretty well, it gives me a lot of hope for how this series will unfold. When Misha wakes up, she finds claw marks on her furniture. Something's wrong with me. This is not normal. Ugh, tell me about it. I can't tell you how many times I've woken up with all my furniture destroyed. Okay, it's never happened to me, but I wanted to feel like I was part of the group. I know that she is panicking because it makes sense for the story. You know, something weird's happening with your body, ah. However, you and I both know that if an actual person was in that situation, they would put two and two together and either think, ah, there was, there's a, a creature that went into my house, or if it's a kid around a teenager age, they'd probably start thinking, hmm, maybe I can transform into a werewolf and they would be ecstatic. And I know there's a lot of Twilight fans who would love to be a wolf girl. Honestly, not even Twilight fans. I'm pretty sure there's just a ton of people who would like to be a wolf girl. I'd like to be a wolf girl. Why not? That'd be sick. This is Jess's dad who seems to have his life together. Wow, with skills like these, you can make a lot of money with commissions. I realize now that Misha mentioned she doesn't have social media. I'm pretty sure she doesn't know what a furry is. Maybe yeah, that's for the best. Also, apparently someone wants Misha dead, but don't worry, Misha's mom's job is kicking butt and also murder, so that's fun. Everyone needs a hobby and now they gotta move again. Now it's time to show Misha the truth about who she is and brings her to Supernatural Academy. Puppies! Oh, people. This is Jessa. She is your twin sister. She's a werewolf! Misha, come on. That would be awesome. This is literally what every middle schooler grew up reading escapism fantasy dreamt about. The least you can do is appreciate it just a little bit. So both of the kids are upset at their parents, as they should be. Hi, I'm Jay. I use they and them. Misha, she and her. Now that's what I like to see. Oh, not the pronouns thing, though that is really nice. I like to see something that's going to piss off bigots and run them out of the fandom. Where's the register? You don't need money here. This really is a fantasy escapism story, oh my gosh. There's always someone who feels better about themselves by telling you how ugly your hair is. I like your hair. Oh, oh, so this is how it's gonna go. <gasps> that has to be the most unrealistic, I'm so surprised I tossed what's in my hand animation I've ever seen, yikes. Turns out their parents didn't have a divorce. Apparently they had to split because they need to protect their daughters from some sort of power or something. Now what I like about how they're approaching Jessa and Misha's relationship is that they are the same, but opposite. Misha doesn't know anything about fey creatures. However, Jessa doesn't know anything about humans. And though they're upset with each other now, they 
have a sort of common ground. And the headmaster's daughter is really mean and is a bully and they both hate her, which is a great method in order to have a common enemy, which will pull them closer together. And we have to go through the sibling bickering stage for the sake of the story, Get, but I hope that it doesn't last long because usually this stage of the story usually just halts the progression of the story instead of actually progressing it. The entire reason we kind of need them to bicker is because it just makes sense for them not to get along and there has to be some sort of struggle in the story, otherwise it'd be it wouldn't be engaging. There has to be something if everyone just went, hi ho, we're friends now. I've never met this person in my life, but life is fantastic. That would suck. So yes, it's overdone. However, I understand it has to be there. I accept it. I'm not happy about it, but I can't be upset that it is there either. You've been lying to me my whole life. And she's been lying to you! I never stopped loving both of you. Why were we all together? Because you are Dragon Mark! A few supernaturals are born with the mark of the Dragon King. Or maybe this will push them together. Nothing brings kids closer together than hating their parents. Work for me and my sister. The Dragon Mark is the mark of the Dragon King, and they basically get treated like second-class citizens, or really, prisoners. And that's why they split up, to protect them. Look at that, they're already coming together. Being angry at parents always works. They put two and two together and realize they need to figure out where that one kid is that the headmaster took away. So they sneak into the headmaster's room and steal some coins and then drops one, so they aren't very good at this. You know, when you read the reviews of this show, they like to compare it to one, Harry Potter, duh, and two, Critical Role, which confused me at first, but now it's actually starting to make sense. A lot of the scenarios in this show focus on the group, and they even have this whole metaphor of being in a pack, kind of like an adventuring party in Dungeons and Dragons. And there is also dragons and a Feywild equivalent that they call the fairy world in the show. This this is very Dungeons and Dragons now that I think about it. Holy crap. I'm out of here. Uh, why don't you let Brax give you a lift home? Hmm. They seem like really good friends. Also, there's some magic CIA investigation stuff going on, so we know they gon' get got. The tokens are used to teleport to visit families, but they're gonna use it for who knows what. However, he only knows Tara was responsible and he wants the names of everyone else who was involved, but she isn't talking, so she takes a big hit to her magic as punishment. Because magic uses ain't snitches. Their teacher shows them what happens to people with dragon marks, and it looks like a great big happy fun time. So more propaganda. The Dragon King destroyed the fairy realm. That's not propaganda. Whoa, hey, propaganda is my buzzword for this video. You can't just steal it. Tara is getting really upset now that she basically can't do magic and no one is really sticking up for her, especially when she lashes out and everyone just leaves. Listen, I know Tara hasn't told all of them that she took the hit for them. However, like, oh my gosh, can't they see she's going through a lot right now? You know, I heard there was a study that people who are rich have less emotional intelligence and Jessa isn't rich, but she does have a lot of power. Maybe her emotional intelligence is just bad. No, that doesn't make sense. Misha isn't rich either, and she sat, got up and left also. So maybe they all just kind of suck. And then the bully girl helps her out, taking advantage of her anger. They're just so selfish. Especially Misha. Especially Misha. Misha is struggling because she wants to talk to Hallie, her human friend, and Dante helps her. There's a rock circle where she can get a connection. I come up here all the time to watch K-pop videos. Now the mean girls are targeting Misha, even switching places with her combat opponent to make fighting hard. Jessa finds out she has twin telepathy and finds Misha literally being drowned to death, but she manages to get her out of there. And they talk to their parents about their birth. And you find out that when the dragon mark appeared, Louis, a sorcerer, appeared and worked on them to try and conceal their mark. And Louis binded Misha's powers, which is why she still can't transform into a wolf. Oh my gosh, this is one of the rare occurrences in fantasy where the parents aren't dead. Good job, author, breaking tropes. Group work time. Now everyone is together and they're gonna put their brains together to open Kristoff's door. Jay, for some reason, hears some music that no one else can hear. And just like a bad horror movie, the party is being split. Jay goes through the wrong door, and so does Brax. On the other side is Wasteland, that neither of them recognize except Jay. They find the door back to the fairy realm. But the fairy realm is dead. Devastated, but not dead. And then they just sort of get captured by plants. 
And by that, I mean it just siphons what magic it can to heal itself. Surprisingly, they get some adults to help out. We see a sort of echo of history where, of course, the only two people who enter the fairy realm is a fae, the original citizens, and a dragon, the destroyer, but now that time has changed, they're on the same side. Well, sort of, Jake goes pretty crazy. It's only by hearing the song emitted from the door that they are able to open the door. Brax has to fight and to get Jay out of there and destroys what little magic the land had left. But now Jay is safe. What I can't tell is how, whether or not this is supposed to be symbolic of how history is doomed to repeat itself, or maybe it's supposed to be the sins of our father will be the sins of our son, or maybe neither of those. Maybe this was purely done to make everyone know that the fairy world still exists and is acceptable. Access accessible. Or maybe both. Either way, this episode has a lot of significance that will definitely appear later on in the series. Speaking of which, the hub with the doors is locked off and going there will get you expelled. And Kristoff comes to punish them by taking as much magic as possible, 60% of their magic, except Misha because she still doesn't have any magic. They complain at how Misha doesn't have powers to their dad and Jessa grabs his talent that allows them to tap into the tide lines. They share their magic with Tara and she does her cool magic stuff to get on the tide lines which siphons their powers back to them. Now they're at 100% magic again. This show tries to be modern in very interesting ways. There was a little tidbit about K-pop, which I thought was fun because it's just a genre of music. However, they also mention Ed Sheeran's Shape of You, and that's where it started feeling kind of weird. You just have to let the animal come to you. Turns out mine likes Ed Sheeran. And though it still works, technically, I imagine if this show is 20 years old and Ed Sheeran isn't all that relevant anymore. It would feel like she, if she said, I don't know, my spirit animal person likes to listen to David Bowie. He's not that relevant anymore. However, technically music is timeless, so it still works. But have it being that recent with it, with them using Ed Sheeran just feels out of place. At least with David Bowie, I, I've never listened to David Bowie's music. However, I do know David Bowie. We don't know if Ed Sheeran's music is going to be culturally relevant within the next 20 years. It's very much a big risk choosing someone who is relevant now. I would have chosen someone who's not quite modern, but also still known, like Britney Spears or Tupac. Jessa gets the body swap talisman and finds out Tara helped her mess with Misha, and Jessa confronts Tara immediately. For a best friend, you sure don't pay a lot of attention to anyone but yourself. And they start fighting like good friends do, but she gets stopped before she goes too far. And then possibly the most awkward, irrational thing happens that just really makes me question how the writing of the series starts to go. I trust you. Even if I was Dragon Mark? You're serious. You just tell him in the middle of daylight? I know you got a crush on each other, but my gosh, you could have done this in a better way. So now Jay is kind of out of the picture and Tara is probably out too. So much for the whole pack mentality metaphor. Jessa thinks of using the body swap talisman to switch with Misha to see if it helps her transform into her wolf. Now Misha knows what it feels like to have magic flowing through in her body. She transforms for the first time. They shift back and call it quits, and then they get caught after curfew and no more body switching. Jessa stops being a twat and apologizes to Tara. The adults are concerned that the Dragon King is rising along with the fairy world, so yeah. And the Dragon King will apparently be revived if there's anyone who is dragon marked that's not in custody. Custody. We learn the surprising fact that shapeshifters can release their beasts and can no longer shapeshift afterward, and that's what Nisha's mom did to protect her. Wow. I thought the parents would just be there to be... parents. I didn't expect there to be actual character from them. I'm pleasantly surprised. They crack up a plan to break into the hub, and there's this creepy cosmic horror kind of deal where Jay is constantly drawn to the door and now they gotta keep them away. The dragon-marked duo goes in, and it takes away their magical disguise. Inside, they meet kids who are dragon-marked, and man, they are weird. Dragon marks upon our skin. Cloisters keep us safe within. Yeah, the dragon-marked aren't living a fun and happy life like they were taught. Then they dip out of there, and now their marks are still there. They gotta stay away from each other because it only glows when they get together. Like, twin power. 
again. On a nightly stroll from all the stress and anxiety, Misha finally transforms into her wolf. Or maybe there's some other reason she transformed. Who really knows? Misha decides to touch the silver blade during gym, and Elda saw her reaction. Now Elda knows she's a wolf. Of course, she reports back to the headmaster. Elda saw a boy attempting to escape the cloister. She said he was caught and taken back by Jonathan LeBron. Wait, hold on. That sounds like a big, fat, bold-faced lie. I thought you were just a jerk and not downright evil. It's finally time to act. They escaped us once, my love. Whoa, pause for a moment. What? Okay, yes, I sort of got the sense that the headmaster was going to eventually be the bad guy. But uh, I imagined it would just be a bad guy and he's going to be annoying and get in the way, kind of like Snape, but without the redemption arc. I feel like the flashback was a very inappropriate way to share that with the audience. It took out a lot of the punch that was supposed to be delivered with it. Everything will make sense soon, my princess, when our family is at the right hand of the Dragon King. Do you see what I mean? That's how they reveal it? That's such a lame way to reveal that. The more I watch, now that I'm halfway through the series, the more I think I should go and actually read the book. The show so far is good, don't get me wrong, but there's not a single moment where I'm just blown away. The tone of everything stays the same. Even though right now we're getting a lot of development, it still doesn't feel like it's really doing anything. Honestly, I think Owl House does this kind of genre better. Most everything about the plot of this show is fine. I like the story, I like the characters, I like the mystery, but there just isn't any highs and lows. It's just like sorta high, sorta low, sorta high, sorta low. There's not any, whoa, whoa. Luckily we do have one moment that hits well, Max finding out Misha is dragon marked right in the middle of the dance around everyone. Nothing's changed. Everything's <gasps> changed. You said you liked me. That was before I knew you were dragon marked. Ouch, well. I guess Dragon Boy is my new favorite. And then Max gets confrontational with Brax for not telling him. Max is very much indoctrinated with all that propaganda. And the headmaster grabs them and summons the door. And now Elda sees what her father is like. They dip, but they don't get far. Now everyone can see they're dragon marked. Thankfully, Max isn't a total jerkwad, and he destroys that wand thing that makes their powers go away. And now the Headmaster has a cool Dragon King scepter, and then summons some big pyramid with the dragon marked children. Pause. I know what upsets me. I think it's the sound design or the sound leveling. You hear someone screaming and like a crowd screaming, but it's the sound, it's like as, as loud as a whisper in the distance. But you hear, mu and you hear music, however, it's so quiet, it may as well not even be there. All the things that should surround these really big moments just aren't there. These scenes feel dead without the proper sound design. No! Do you hear it? Do you see what I mean? No! He breaks the kids out and now they're all under his mind control. So he's got an army of teenagers and when they're surrounded, uh, oh yeah, okay. She can turn into a dragon, and I guess that makes sense. A dragon marked and all that jazz. So the headmaster decides, nah, I'm done, and then disappears. Now all those kids aren't mind controlled. Now the different clans are upset with the wolf clan for hiding the dragon marked. Not surprisingly, they're bully they're being bullied too. The council wouldn't listen to me and let me clear dad's name, and they're saying I killed Kristoff with dragon fire. They ask a magic tree for help and it gives them riddles. So that doesn't help. And now there's Robocops out there to hunt down Jessa and Misha, and also their dad is sentenced to house arrest. Now that the obvious parts of the story has unfolded, their secret being made public and people hunting them down, now the story starts to become a bit more engaging. Now it's leaning more towards Dungeons and Dragons that just so happens to be taking place at a magic school, rather than Harry Potter. And since I love Dungeons and Dragons way more than Harry Potter, I am very okay with this. Elda is doing something. Her dad is gone and we have no idea what she plans to do now. They decide to tap into the tithe lines beneath the tree in order to power up Terra, but the enforcers are on them and they get away. But now Jay is with them in New York and Terra gets captured. Kind of weird, but apparently the Dragon King wasn't killed. They sealed in between, they, they sealed them in between life and death. So the Dragon King can come back, but who published this book? What the heck? You know, I'm pretty good at looking over plot holes because usually when people point out plot holes, they aren't really 
plot holes, like the internet claims to think they are. But this just feels like a really weird inconsistency. Like, they didn't really retcon the story of the Dragon King. However, where did this come from? Why does this book exist? How did they get this story? I feel like there's a lot of details. I, I feel like I probably missed something, honestly, watching this. Jessa and Jay aren't doing too well in the human world, so Jessa and Jay have to come out and tell Hallie about werewolves and magic and stuff. What are you doing? Trying to help Jay blend in. You can't just change someone's skin color. You're right. I'm sorry. Hold on, wait. What? I get it, the metaphor of hiding who you are and racism and blah, blah, blah. But like, seriously, this is not the same thing. They are trying to not be killed. They are not trying to insult a whole group of people. This feels like a sort of performative progressivism. I like the idea of having this parallel problematic racial ostracization, but this isn't the same thing. You look like you just came from a pride parade. Perfect. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised if the writers were all together writing this episode and one of them said, wait, we may piss off people if we commit to this. Give me that. Let me see here. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, let's play it safe and just make them look queer. They're already androgynous, it'll work. If the point of this episode, if the scene was supposed to show how progressive they are, it was stupid. However, if it was to cover their butts and in fear of potential backlash, I think it's smart how they played this. Someone is freeing the other dragon marked and Max and Brax plan to find out who. Some fairies find Jay and they start interrogating them. They meet a pop idol who just so happens to be a fairy and they ask him to convince the eldest that they aren't a threat. I found them, they're in New York. Wow, that was fast. These guys don't mess around. The new headmaster takes Elda to see the dragon marked, and even though magic should be impossible, she does magic anyway. And I have no idea what they're alluding to, but I figure it's going to be important somehow. Enforcers come, but Pop Idol Dude saves them. It's Reese. He's dead. <gasps> no! Do you expect the Pop Idol dude to hold his own against enforcers? I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did. Max and Brax hunt down a conclave, hoping to catch Kristoff, and oh look, there he is! Kristoff brings out the dragon-marked kids to fight. The enforcers can duplicate themselves, and they figure they should merge them all together into one wizard to finish him off. And all those fairies they meet trap him, which, you know, to be frank, the enforcers were pretty underwhelming. Lots of talk, not a lot of bite. Max hypnotizes him into believing he's powerless, and oh no, well, I wasn't expecting that. Elda touches a magic frog statue and it gives her dark powers. This is slowly drifting away from a story and drifting more towards stuff just happening. Now that Kristoff is captured, they go to Jessa and Misha and now they're welcome back home. Okay, them catching Kristoff was also anticlimactic. You're telling me the guy who's been plotting this big evil scheme just so happened to go to the ob most obvious place he would go to? and get captured by two teenagers? There is no buildup with this. It's just bland. I would have preferred it if it was like a, hmm, this was too easy, which is incredibly cliche, but at least it tells the audience, hey, don't worry, this isn't bad writing. We're just intentionally telling you that things are not what they seem. Who, 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 who? There is going to be an exposition sooner or later. Jay says they're gonna stay in New York to be around the fairy people there so they can I don't know, heal from the fairy world problem they had. They're just, they're not normal. Wait, guys, you're still dragon marked. I mean, yeah, Kristoff is captured, but that's just one problem fixed. That is not a cure-all to everything that's going on. Speaking of which, Kristoff isn't actually in a cell. He did some magic stuff to pretend he's in a cell and now he's convincing students to join him. Help me raise the Dragon King and you and all harpies will finally be free. What do you need me to do? Seriously? You? You all get told that the Dragon King will literally end existence and you're willing to switch sides at the drop of the hat? This series started off strong and has slowly been lazier and lazier as it progresses. And to get this, Jay hears the fairy world while in New York and then teleports them to it, even though it seriously messed with Jay's head when they were, went there. And so why would you bring more people there? Oh, wow, Jay does the creepy fusion thing again. I should let it have you. But she brings them back. And then the ultra powerful Lois just shows up for no reason and is all like, hey, what up? I know how to destroy the Dragon King. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
Please tell me that's Kristoff just messing with Jay or something, because that's a whole new level of bad. And during Kristoff's trial, he just projects to everyone that they should take the human world for supernatural utopia. And the only way to do this is to raise the Dragon King. <gasps> we want Kristoff released! We want the new world, Kristoff promised! You were all absolutely against the Dragon King, and now you're all suddenly on board? People don't just switch sides like that. Like, what is even going on? We're missing out the major steps that takes place in order to convince people. Not one mediocre speech from a convicted villain. Uniting a whole group of people is a process, not an afternoon hobby. And Lois is there again to quell the people being dumb. Lois tells them about how the twins can actually stop the Dragon King. They also gotta figure out how Kristoff is getting in and out of his cell and they manage to get some blood. There was a set of Dragon Mark twins before Jessa and Misha? In fact, I've been searching for them for years. Oh, yeah, Jay is back, by the way. Apparently, that wasn't Kristoff. The new headmaster is working with Kristoff to impersonate him. You think you figured it out. Kristoff was never in custody. <laughs> okay, credit where it's due. I guess this wasn't as stupid as I thought it was, but it's still not that amazing. I think what's making me really upset about this is that they haven't explained any of the villain's motivations. Kristoff wants power? So that's meh? The new headmaster, we don't know, doesn't have a motivation yet, apparently. Elda is probably the most interesting just because like, her motivation is teen angst and her dad kinda sucks. So that makes sense. Otherwise, it's all very surface level. Misha agrees to go with her if she lets Max live and she accepts, but she manages to not. Sandra and her sister are the East West twins. Wait, they're the twins? Okay, seems random. The four of us together are what races the Dragon King. Misha does what she thinks is a very smart thing and locks herself up in a crystal so that they can't use her to summon the Dragon King. But also now she's just vulnerable. So how exactly does this help? And then the other twins find Max and lock him up in a crystal and they take Misha. Elda, the actually interesting villain, is convincing the Dragon Mark kids to join her and gives them more power. At this point, can we just skip to summoning the Dragon King? Because this is getting ridiculous. At least with the other Dragon Marked twins, their motivation makes sense. They're treated like dirt and they want revenge on everyone. Now, Kristoff has been demoted to second in command. Jessa and Misha still have twin telepathy, so they know where they are and they use guns? In Magic Land? I never thought I'd see the day. Jessa switches bodies with Misha so that Misha isn't in a crystal, so okay, I guess she's being nice. But also, why? Be heroic and let Misha have your body so that she isn't panicking? But also this only makes things more complicated. Jessa and Misha really don't think things through. They want to do something all the time, even though it's obvious they should stay out of something. I get that the story requires them to do something for the sake of their being a story, however, it kind of it stops being engaging when you stop and think, wow, everything they're doing is kind of stupid. I'm not excited to read this. They're just gonna do something stupid again. Then they decide to go to Jessa because, I don't know, at this point, what does it matter? Elda breaks the dragon kids free. Now Elda's trying to free the dragon king too, but not with her dad because he's jerk. Apparently Elda got her magic from the shadow spawn, a whole new villain they're talking about right now. Back in New York, they ask the fairies to just teleport them to Kristoff. They all put them in their places and start summoning the Dragon King. The Dragon King doesn't need Kristoff, so they yeet him into lava. Misha makes a sword from the crystal tomb and then pokes the Dragon King, and for some reason, he's turned to crystal, but he can still move, so it's not that easy. But apparently he's connected to the sword, so they shatter the sword and then they shatter the dragon. This was all concocted within the last two episodes. And that's it. That's all it took to defeat the Dragon King that presumably displaced the entire fairy world. Like, are you serious? That's it? That's the, that's the solution? It took a dumb rhyme from a comic book? And when did Misha get the power to make that spell? Like... This ending feels just hobbled together. And yet, yeah, now Dragon Mark kids are free. The love interests come together. Typical happy ending, who cares? This show sucks. 
what happened? There's no buildup for anything. The payoff was pitiful. There was so much time dedicated to uninteresting plot twists that took away from the development of the actual plot and characters. Why did Kristoff want to summon the Dragon King? We should have been introduced to the other twins earlier. The enforcers just were not interesting and ate up a ton of time. And Jessa and Misha really did not grow in this story. They're still the same. They rush into dumb situations and for some reason it works out for them. There's like one time when they actually stopped and like observed their enemy and came up with a solution. This show had a lot of good things going for it, but this execution was so bad. Now I'm glad I didn't read the books for this video. Apparently a lot of the reviews are positive, but it seems like the execution of the books also has problems given some of the reviews that I've read. Do I think you should read the book if you like the show? Absolutely. You're basically guaranteed to have a better version of this story if you read the book, but I know that I'm not going to after the disappointment of the show. And I am sorry, not only to those of you who asked me to cover the show, but also to the author and the writers behind the show, because I know you're real people and I am horrified if you actually watch this because I don't want to hurt the people who worked on this, but I just can't pretend I liked how this ended. Tell me what you thought in the comments below. Am I wrong? Did you read the book? How do you feel about this show? Follow me on TikTok and the rest of my social media. I have a Patreon if you want stickers and trading cards. Stay beautiful and keep playing.